welcome to VPG's Virtual Water Cooler Chat Podcast, where we share lessons and stories of women professionals to help empower other women and expand a greater circle of influence so we walk our journey with those who understand and appreciate us. Today, we sit down with principal and founder of Virtual Patent Gateway, Ashley Chung. She is a first-generation immigrant from Hong Kong and our fearless leader here at VPG. Ashley founded VPG in January of 2020 to leverage her paralegal skills on a virtual platform. She has supported attorneys for over two decades, first in construction litigation and then in patent litigation, and found her niche in PTAB practice, eventually wanting to take that skill set and passion to help support patent practitioners in the patent and trial appeal practices. Ashley double majored in political science and East Asian languages and cultures, and has a master's in East Asian languages and cultures from the University of Kansas. Hi, Ashley. Thank you for (laughs) being on the podcast today. I'm so excited to interview you and learn a little bit more about you and your path and your journey and uh, to see kind of the genesis of Virtual Patent Gateway. So to kick things off, how did you choose your path to becoming an entrepreneur? And do you think you picked the right path? Well, first of all, let me thank you for being my interviewer. And I am really, really grateful to have you and other people on the Virtual Patent Gateway team. So when I thought about who is going to be the best person to interview me, I was like, let me get Tori Wesley. So (laughs) thank you for doing that. Let's get to the question. If you're looking for aha moment, it wasn't like that. Let me go ahead and start by defining two things. When you said the word path in the Chinese character, it is the word Tao, D-A-O or T-A-O. So basically it's the way and how the universe is actually being in charge in accordance to the Taoists. And there is a literature called the Book of Changes or I Ching. And it basically, a lot of people that look into the Taoist philosophy knows about this. And I used to be an East Asian languages and culture uh, major, both in undergrad and master's degree. So those are some of the things that had influence in my mindset, but I didn't really think too much of it when I came out to start working. And in terms, in terms of entrepreneurship, I have to say that when I came out, I wasn't really thinking about entrepreneurship in the traditional sense of what people go on a TEDx talk to talk about, oh, this is how I did it. I go into a conference room. I got laid off. It's nothing like that. It started out, I was a workaholic. So I used to be doing things like with such intensity and I was good at my work, but I work a lot. And I, I was in the legal industry for a long time, fell into paralegal work by accident. And then in 2017, my dad had passed. He actually passed very suddenly. So I had the responsibility of taking care of my mom. So my mom lives with me and it becomes very difficult for me to juggle a litigation schedule and um, life. Um, so. If you look at the traditional definition uh, definition of entrepreneurship, it's, um, for example, Marion Webster's definition would be one who organizes, manages, or assumes the risk of a business or enterprise. So when I first started, it was just really trying to figure out a way of how to apply my skill set and a way that I can have some level of certainty. Now, how I build this, It really was helpful that I have maintained really good network of people. So when people find out that I was interested in building my consultancy from day one, I had people contacting me. And one of the person, and and you know what, like when you, I've been in the business for 20 plus years, some of the baby attorneys (laughs) that I knew, they become my big partners or like, you know, general counsel of corporations or, you know, um, leaders in that field. So when people knew that I was going to do this virtual consultancy and let it mind you that it was right before COVID, and I did not know that two months down the road, 
a three month down the road, COVID would happen. So when I started in January 2020, it was really just trying to figure out a way to have a little bit more balanced life. So it wasn't really traditional. Sorry to disappoint you. It wasn't like, oh my God, I have an epiphany. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. That's not the case. And did I really pick the right path? I think so. So the thing is like, I don't think that it's done. Is it the path? I, I think that there's a lot more self-discovery is waiting to be reviewed. So I think for the time being, it is the right path. Yeah, that's great. And I feel like your journey is just more like it kind of a naturally happened, like your Tao kind of revealed itself. And you actually slid right into my next question, which is um, so far, what are some of the things that you have learned about yourself through this path of becoming an entrepreneur, leading a team, um, kind of making your own way? So the very first thing that I would say, it would be my motto, nothing venture, nothing gain. Um, this is not actually my, I, I adapted this from one of my late professor. He was a Harvard Law graduate and very intelligent Chinese scholar. He just saw so much in me that I didn't see it in myself. And I wasn't sure why he was being so helpful. You know, So I'm like, what do you even really see in me at that time? I mean, I did work hard, study hard. My parents had a Chinese restaurant in Lawrence, Kansas. And so I always had to kind of juggle between school work, school work. And then at some point I realized that, oh my God, I cannot just list being a waitress or hostess at the restaurant on my resume. How far would that take me? You know? So I then I started studying and um because of this particular professor, his name is Clay Stoltenberg, he really did when I'm reflecting on my life and the contribution that he made to my intellectual curiosity was pretty significant because growing up, I was sort of taught to not really question authority. But with him, when I was studying, doing my thesis, I did my thesis on uh, intercultural negotiations, and he remote advising me. And that was like back in the days. And we'll just get on a phone call and did like, you know, talk. He was like, oh, where, where? sometimes I don't even know where I'm going with my themes. And most of my professor was like, just like, no, this is not right. But he just kind of let me go. And when I was defending my thesis, um, he was just very supportive. He knew that I would, he knew that I was going to be very nervous. So he actually, like on his own dime, flew to Lawrence because he was in uh, Saratoga Springs at the time. Um, he flew to Lawrence and then I was outside of the room that I was supposed to be defending. I was sitting there at like 9 a.m. And the defense is actually in front of a committee of four professor. And I was so scared. But he just came in like at around 9.15 or so. And basically, we went into the, the classroom and he prepped me. Because he knew that I was going to be nervous. And he was just like, took the time to help me through that. And at the end of the thesis, the thesis advisor was so like impressed with the, 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 the argument. And he also realized that he did not have, because Clyde was the co-chair. So at the end of the thesis defense, the thesis advisor actually said that he did more work than in nurturing you in completing this thesis than I did. So I'm going to step down as the chair and let him be the chair. That was really powerful. I've never really talked about that, and but I think that's nothing venture, nothing gained. That's something that he always said from day one to me. So it really instilled that seed in my mind. Uh, that's number one. Number two is that, and of course, there's a whole myriad of things that we could talk about, but I think being people-driven, it's really important in setting up, you know, in a team environment, uh, when you're a leader. Now, I really never thought about myself as a leader, 
when I first started, I knew that there were some clients were asking me, it was like, so are you the lone wolf here? Like, what was my business? Yeah, I guess I'm the lone wolf, you know? And at the time, Virtual Bank Gateway VPG was really small. And I only have a couple of people. And it's really a business model that is quite interesting, but it's really difficult to have it in practice because it's offering really great, it's, it's a great and very innovative business model. It's like people pay as you sort of like come and it's virtual on demand. And the skill set that I provide, it's really supporting. PTAP practitioners. And virtual patent gay a way, we do not, we have to be very careful in advertising or promoting or even representing ourselves as not providing legal advice. So something that I've learned that is that, you know, when you support the client, you have to be very careful in not basically in basically outlining the fact that you're not an attorney. And they know that. And just making sure that while they can rely on you, they also need to exercise their discretion as an attorney because under the ABA model rules, um, paralegals are supervised by attorneys. So you want to make sure that while you're confident in doing your work, they should also question you so that they can actually, I mean, that's part of their due diligence. So that was really um, something, that part of the people driven is knowing how to portray your self-confidence to your client, but at the same time, drawing that boundary of professionalism, that that's with the client. With the team, it didn't help that I was a people pleaser for most of my life. So boundaries is a very difficult thing for me to draw. So I think that a lot of time, when I say people focus, one thing that I, uh, and being, being people driven, I think one thing that I really learned that is that sometimes people appreciate honesty more than you think and being candid. And especially in COVID, everybody has their own issues and don't assume. If you think that, you, if you sense that something is wrong, maybe in a very sensitive way and ask if there's something that you could do to help, you know, just being caring. So you feel like you've learned how to be caring, set boundaries. And I feel like that is really important because I feel like there is a shift coming culturally just with how workplaces are run. I've had friends in the legal field who have been a little bit stressed out about maybe more of a so-called toxic workplace, things like that, where it's not as positive or really nurturing. It's, it's just not a, always a fun place to work. So from your own experience, I'm not sure if you've dealt with that at any point, what kind of inspires you to change the workplace now as an entrepreneur, you get to kind of build your own habitat as it be with your team members and then how do you take steps to promote a positive and like a healthy working environment for your team? First thing, I think that toxicity is a high standard to measure. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we use the word interchangeably and sometimes it's a little bit too casual. And listen, VPG, as much as I like to have it as a you know happy-go-lucky place, it is still a business organization. And in comparison to the larger organization, I think that I have more freedom to operate. And, but doing that also means that I'm 100% accountable if something goes wrong. That is a very, very scary place to be, you know, when you're like small business owner. And I have, um, I have good ideas, but... If, even if you have good ideas, if you don't have good people around you to help you build that vision, it's fertile. Mm. And I think that is one of the things that made me realize that I have this business model that is actually kind of cool. And I can call the shot as long as I can actually pay for it. And... I think what inspired me is my own 
intellectual curiosity. I've mm. always been, and also I'm a continuous learner. I have all, and then again, it could be influenced by Clyde. I love reading. I love listening to to um, podcasts and audio books. So one of the latest audio book that I listened to, it was from Arthur Brooks, and it's called From Strength to Strength, where he talked about driver's addiction. I think it also tied into Simon Sinek's like finite and infinite game. And you can tell that I just love, and, and I love reading and listening to just <laughs> absorbing the knowledge like a sponge. But I think that it goes against ties into this nothing venture, nothing gain. I have this platform that I created. At the beginning, it was only me in my basement. Somehow it expanded the way it expanded it to something different and transformed into something different. So why not? You know, I don't know where this is going to take me. Sasha mm-hmm. would say, if you don't believe in yourself, and we don't hear you believing, you know, how can we believe in you if we don't hear you believe in yourself? Well, culturally, it was very difficult for me to outwardly portray that I believe in myself. But inwardly, I think I have a lot of self-confidence. I'll give you an example. Very few people knew about this. So a month before I left my job, I was driving and I was like, oh, my car is going to hit 100,000 miles. I'm like, I'm going to have to build a business? I have really great credit. But then what about the verifiable income? <laughs> so then I went home and told my mom, I, was like, I think I need to change a car. And she goes like, oh, what did you decide to do that? I was like, because I need to have my verifiable income. I won't, no one will trust me for a loan and I will have my savings, but I need to have my verifiable income. So that's what stuck in my head. So I went to negotiate a deal with a really, and I'm usually a pretty good negotiator. And so I went to negotiate a deal on a 2.99% zero down payment for my current car. So that is currently still only like 60,000 miles. But I'm not hitting 100,000 miles. I still have a few years. And when VPG comes in, like with, I mean, I've never really been, we've been doing pretty well even from day one. And so I think that is really a blessing. But when my friend taught me, so in my sort of like own consciousness, it never came to my mind that, can I afford to pay that payment? Like now that you don't have a full-time job, like my brother used to say, oh, you're now an employee. I'm saying, no, I'm self-employed, you know? So um, uh, I thank God for my brother and my mom too, you know, for being there to support me. And um, morally and sometimes financially, I think that's really just being able to have someone to be there to help me know that I'm not alone is really helpful. So yeah, and then our friend was like, have you ever, has it ever come across your mind that you might not be able to pay for the payment? I was like, no, not the money. <laughs> I just choose not to pay them all at once. But once I start the business and have no W-2, then nobody will actually, like they will just be not, be not declining. And I think that's one of the other lessons and in terms of the workplace, that's why I am much more sensitive to like the people that I, um, that's on my team. I really want to make sure that they are paid timely so that um, to the extent that I can, I usually make want to make sure that I pay them well and pay them timely. So that's why I want to have a workplace that is a little bit different because sometimes we all need a little bit of help. Yeah, definitely. I feel like that's important. I feel like, yeah, you're always positive. Like how do you take your positivity and bring it to the the work environment? I'm not always positive, but (laughs) <laughs> I feel um, like you at least um, are a little bit bubbly and despite any challenges you face, you are able to like take it in and move on and keep like a confident uh, view towards the future. So one thing you probably don't know about me is that I'm a closet introvert. Mm, okay. I don't know that I ever think that I'm a fake person, 
because most people who know me know that I'm not a fake person. But I think sometimes I just am so accustomed to this people pleasing. And I feel like that I just need to. I was like, well, you know, for example, in a job environment, it's like I'm not supposed to show my vulnerability. And um, that has changed a bit. But, you know, it's just like I wasn't quite allowed myself to be myself. I didn't think that it was the proper decor. So it was very strict, very traditional. Um, how do I maintain positivity? Books help, podcasts help, friends and your network of people and your team. I have a really supportive um, group of friends that really have been there for me. For example, one of my clients from day one, we've been almost three years. So they've been our client from day one. And I really do value both the professional relationship and also the friendship that I have from these people. And also, you know, they did not, like, for example, now with all the layoffs, it's really rare to have someone that trusts you. They give me the freedom to sort of, like, pursue what I want as long as I get the job done. And sometimes in the traditional work model, people would be like, oh, um, you're working for us. You should not be working for somebody else. So one of the things that BPG does is that we, because we are sort of consulting business, we run conflicts. So if usually when before engagement, I would talk to the client and let them know that give me the numbers and the client opposing counsel, I run the conflict and let you know whether we could cover for you. And then we will send an engagement letter and let them know that this is the terms and the scope of work that we're supposed to cover. Now, there have been times that I have to learn some major lessons in terms of like, oh, wow, I didn't think about this. Just chop it up as lessons learned. The next time you just re revise your engagement. And also knowing your worth is really important because people are always going to try to negotiate because well, that's what lawyers do <laughs> right yeah. so I think know your worth know what you can negotiate and know what you are not willing to negotiate I think that's really important um, and that's the type of environment that I want to sort of build by mentoring and just growing with my team yes I was going to ask you you know what gets you out of bed in the morning what drives you every day can you speak a little bit to that? And then we can talk about your mentoring because I think that is a really cool part of VPG. So what gets me out of the morning? Um, <laughs> have you ever heard of the Mel Robin show? I haven't. So Mel Robin is a podcaster. She used to be a lawyer. There was a lot of lessons learned that she shared publicly on podcasts and YouTube. And she was like, she was even running some morning show or something like that. Really, really influential thought leader. And what she does, what she said is the five second rule. It's five or three, two, one, get up, you know? And unfortunately, that's not what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds, I need to do that as well. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we all can. I mean, there are times I was like, oh, what was the five second rules? But I think... I think being sort of like, I think trained very well from being a child because um, we immigrated to the States, you know, probably about 30 some years ago. Yeah, something like that. And my parents own a Chinese restaurant in Lawrence, Kansas. And so I always have to sort of juggle between schoolwork and I did all the way to master's study. So you can tell that it become really increasingly difficult. And I would have my corner table at the restaurant to study by the exit sign. I don't know whether that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's really a sign, but I have an exit sign table that I have there. And I would just like, when it's not busy, I'll just go and do my study. And it started from when I was at junior high and then high school and, you know, college up to the master's program. So I think that I have not figured out the formula of how to get more than 24 hours a day. So mm -hmm. I don't really sleep that much. I think I, uh, on average, I've been usually do like maybe 
five hours. Okay. I'm a really good day at zero eight hours. But I think that some people call me the energizer rabbit. But I, unless I'm really sick or something like that, I generally, those five hours, it's enough for me. So I think just habitually trying to juggle between so many things and trying to fit it all in, I've just developed this habit of just get up. I don't even need the five second rules to get up. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, you gotta go to do this. And, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. And some of the stuff that I had been doing, it really was very intense. It's like brain intense. It's like really a lot of thinking. When you didn't really have a choice, you just kind of do it. Yeah, that makes sense. So one of the cooler things that I like about Virtual Patent Gateway is that you have a dedication to helping mentor and inspire young women who are doing many different things, maybe in STEM, maybe in the legal career. It seems like you have like a few girls on the team who you really are putting time into to make sure that they are fully equipped for the workplace in the future. What would you like to leave them with? So when they, you know, fly freely and after they've learned everything from VPG, like what things do you want them to take with them as they, you know, make their own path? I'm going to give you two points on this. The first one is be kind to other people. Um, For them, I would hope that what I have demonstrated is that I I don't always agree with people. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I can be very demanding. And I'm learning to be much more candid with people because sometimes we lack feedback. You just have to be sort of like listen and talk to them and tell them, and this is what I'm hoping to teach. And sometimes I fail because <laughs> I'm not always patient. And then be kind to people because you really don't know exactly what everyone's going through, especially during COVID. Mm-hmm. So I think that if one thing that I have taught them is that just be patient and don't judge people by what what is Stephen Covey, Covey said. I think he says something about like we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their action. And just give people a room, just in case, you know, you mm-hmm. never know. Maybe they had a really bad day, you know, flat tire, who knows, right? So that's the number one point. And the number two point is that I really want to kind of like emphasize is like learn to grow others because you, through growing others, you grow yourself. Mm-hmm. The things that you don't see about yourself when you are growing others, that's how you kind of come to self-reflect. And plus, it's a good thing to do. You mm-hmm. know, we have a culture of like, me, 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 you know? And the problem is like, I think Simon Sinek said that, you know, we have a whole section in the bookstore or that talk about self-help, but what section do we have to help others? You know, and when you don't feel as self-focused, I think sometimes that's the best way to live. Mm. I don't know. I mean, maybe not the best way, but it's it's really, it makes you feel like that you're doing something to contribute to the greater goods. Mm. Um, I think those are the two points. Um, Be kind to people and grow others because it helped grow yourself. Definitely, definitely. And just to kind of close here, what are some key lessons that you've learned that throughout your own path, maybe even before you became an entrepreneur or just like in your life that you would like to share with the audience? A couple of points, I think maybe two or three. One is not be so outcome dependent. Like for example, when we run a webinar, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, we want it to go viral, but if it doesn't, we have actually put something out there to benefit other people. I think that that sharing of the knowledge should be sufficient, but we have, we are taught in a society that we are like, okay, how many attendees do you have? How many views do you have? How many likes do you have? How many shares do you have? Does it not defeat the purpose of like knowledge? Yeah. Dissemination? I don't know. I stopped counting likes because 
like, I know I'm not going to have enough light. So I just finish one thing and then I'll just kind of move on to the next thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then at some point, the universe will make it happen or not. But you would have done what you needed to do. So that's number one. I think the other part is um, about people pleasing. And I learned to draw boundaries. And I think sometimes that... I think of, um, what I've heard is people pleasing is actually an act of self betrayal mm. because you are not. I didn't come up with this. <laughs> I think it might be from Adam Grant work life, and he was interviewing someone who did was talking about how to have a good debate. Mm. So I never really put it in that particular context, and. I think it is true in when I, I kind of put it in that context. When I was trying to people please, I didn't want to hurt people's feelings. And also maybe because I wasn't confident enough to know to want to even argue a point and maybe not thinking that my points are worth hearing. And I think that is something that I'm actively working to grow. Despite what other people think, I mean, I would do it respectfully, but despite what other people think, I'm entitled to my own opinion. And also, the other thing is, you know, people have so much problems these days. The last thing that they are thinking about is you. Mm -hmm. So you just say your points and they could either agree or disagree and you just move on. And I guess, again, let the universe take care of its own, you know? Finally, I think I wanted to kind of close this. It's like, trust your own journey. There mm -hmm. is really a reason for everything. You may not know how it works. And I am not, I'm not religious myself. Um, but I do believe in, as I'm kind of growing older, mm -hmm. I'm beginning to think that there might be something in the higher power. Mm -hmm whatever it is. Um, and I think that trust that as long as you act with integrity, be kind to people and pay your mortgage <laughs> so that you have a place to stay uh -huh. um, and do, you know, do things that is within what a good and kind human being does, then the rest of it, it will kind of take care of its course. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the Dow to virtual gateway. <laughs> and I hope I answer your questions. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, you did. You did. Thank you so much. I feel like I just learned a lot more about you, a lot more about virtual patent gateway, the uh, cornerstones and foundations of it. So thank you so much for giving me the honor to interview you and learn more. And I'm excited for this episode.